Hi everybody and welcome to our panel discussion on children's human rights and community learning and development. I hope you were bopping away there in your rooms just like I was, it's a shame I couldn't see you all. But this event is being hosted by the Children's Parliament um, as part of the Year of Childhood. Um, my name is Claire McGillivray and I'm the facilitator for today's event, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I'm the Interim Director of Making Rights Real, which is a new charity in Scotland that will be working with communities to use the power of human rights in practice. And I'm on the board of the International Association for Community Development. I'm supporting today um, being um, a trustee for the Children's Parliament, which I love. So this event is really close to my heart. I'm passionate about community learning and development and about children's rights. So it's like having all the things that I love in one place today. So I'm really excited and thrilled that, that you're all here today. Um, I'm so excited that I put on my big Unfairty badge today. So if you're not an Unfairty yet standing up for children's rights, do join the movement and sign up at the Children's Parliament website. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the format for today. We've only got an hour, so an hour long, it's going to be a cracking event and we'll include reflections on the subject um, today from our four panelists, which will be followed by a question and answer session. Your cameras and microphones are turned off for the duration of the webinar. So we can't see you, but you can see us, which feels a little bit weird. Um, the webinar is being recorded and will be hosted on the Children's Parliament website and YouTube channel afterwards. We'd love to hear from you from today. So put your questions in the chat box, um, in the question box while the speakers are talking. And although we'll only be able to take a few questions today because we don't have a whole lot of time, we will use the questions and the comments to support continued dialogue on this subject. You'll have noticed maybe already today that um, Ross is live tweeting the event on the Children's Parliament um, Twitter feed and the hashtags are children CLD and year of childhood 2021. So do send, send in your pictures of what you're doing so that we can see you and if you were bopping away there to your tunes that would be lovely to see that. Do use those hashtags and let's get the let's get this trending so that we're above Barnard Castle today which I think is the other thing that's trending um, today in Scotland. Why is this event happening today? Well, two weeks ago, on the 16th of March, MSPs voted unanimously to make children's rights, as outlined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, law in Scotland. That was the most important law passed in the Scottish Parliament since devolution, and was the culmination of decades of campaigning by the incredible children's rights sector in Scotland. And some of them are here today. So a massive cheer for anyone who's been involved in that movement. It's been incredible um, to see your work come to fruition. Um, and that uh, endorsement really reflects the increase in support for children's human rights across Scotland's public bodies and services. But what does that mean for those of us who are working in the fields of community learning and development? And the aim of this event is to bring together experts from the fields of children's human rights and CLD to consider this opportune moment, how we can make connections between these two important fields of theory and practice. We've got four incredible speakers joining us today for the panel, and we'll hear from them shortly. I'm just going to introduce all of them at once, and then we'll be introducing them individually to come on and speak. Our first speaker today um, is Dr. Marion Allison. Marion is the director of the CLD Standards Council for Scotland. She's over 20 years of experience in the sector as a youth work manager, associate social assessor for HMI, and she's also lectured on the BA Honours um, Community Education course at the University of the West of Scotland. Her doctoral research focused on young people, entrepreneurship and social networks. So welcome, Marianne. Can't wait to hear from you in a minute. 
Our second speaker will be Professor John Davis. John's a professor of education at the University of Strathclyde. He previously worked at the University of Edinburgh as director of the BA in Childhood Studies, head of Department of Educational Studies and subsequently professor of childhood inclusion. His research focuses on childhood, disability, inclusion, and social justice, and seeks to support children, young people, parents, and professionals to develop creative and innovative solutions to their life issues. Welcome, John. Our third speaker today will be Margaret Ledworth. Ledworth. Margaret is an Emeritus Professor of Community Development and Social Justice at the University of Cumbria. She's also a coordinator of the International Collaborative Action Research Network. Margaret is the author of several books on community development theory and practice, including Community Development, A Critical and Radical Approach, which just came out, I think, last year, Margaret. Um, community Development in Action, Putting Freire into Practice, and Community Development, A Critical Approach. So absolutely thrilled you could be with us today, Margaret. And our final speaker today is Cathy McCulloch. Cathy is the co-founder and direct co-director of the Children's Parliament. She trained at Murray House in community education. And while Cathy has turned her hand to organizational development, change management, training, fundraising, it's in seeing the impact of children's human rights-based approach has on outcomes for children that has been Cathy's driving passion for the past 20 years. In 2017, she received an OBE for services to children's rights and well-being. So thanks for being here, all of you. It's a cracking lineup we've got today. And without any further ado, I'm going to fire over to Marion Allison, who's got the floor for about five minutes. Oh my goodness, Claire, thank you very much. And thanks for that kind introduction. Five minutes to answer four big questions. How on earth do we ever do that? So what I, I am going to try and do is just crack on um, and have a real look at the four questions that Claire um, sent me. So first of all, she asked, what are the commonalities between children's rights? Um, and, oh, sorry, where does children fit into CLD theory and practice? First question. So I thought it would be important to start with thinking about the art, Article 1, the definition of the child. Everybody under the age of 18 has all the rights that are in the convention. So when you think about community learning and development, there's two ways actually of approaching it. Number one, it's a noun. If you think about community learning and development, it, are, it is the services that all our children in Scotland could and should have access to, particularly through local authority, local authority services and voluntary organisations. So you will see these types of services in community halls and centres, in youth clubs and family learning spaces, holiday programmes, summer programmes, lots of different um, young mums groups, there's so uh, the Children's Parliament, the Scottish Youth Parliament, lots of different services that are with and for young people in Scotland. So if you think about CLD as being a particular, a noun, it's something that we do. But it's also a verb, it is a field of professional practice. And that's the bit that's really um, quite exciting for me when it comes to rights, because it's a field of professional practice that enables people to identify their individual and their collective goals to engage in learning and to bring about action for positive change. It's dialogical. It's about working with children, working with young people to establish what it is that they, they need, they want, they have to change and about going on that journey. It's always a two way process. It's never just about you filling the young person with your views, values of what you want to happen. It's always dialogical about the young people helping to set that agenda. And CLD is very much about focusing on work with communities and participants who are excluded um, in the main from decision-making processes. So it's really um, underpinned overall by um, a set of values that we work to. And when I was preparing for the next question that Claire had sent me about the commonalities between children's rights and community developments, what struck me at the heart of it, what strikes me at the heart of all of this really powerful movement, our values, is about the kind of country that we want to live in, the kind of society that we are, 
And for me, children's rights are that magic, that, that glue that will hold us together in the type of world that we want our children to grow up in and that we as adults want to be better and improving and taking that um, opportunity to grow. So first of all, one of the founding principles of community development is about self-determination. It's about starting where people are. And when I was looking at the different articles, there's at least five across the 54 that hit upon self-determination about the freedom for thought, the freedom for belief, the freedom for um, religion, the right to privacy, the right to leisure, the, light, the right to play and the right to culture. And for me, the self-determination aspect was really important in terms of CLD round about the freedom of association. I would say that's probably most critical. Our children and young people often access services that they have to. For instance, going to school is a legal requirement. But the freedom of association is often where our education and where our true learning, um, our ideas of citizenship, the notion of network and fun is round about that association. So when I talked about CLD being a noun, about being that youth club, about being that family learning centre, about being the children's parliament, that's absolutely critical to young people's rights. And all of a sudden having that as something that young people can demand is no longer just a service that perhaps local authorities or public bodies can say, yeah, well, it's, it's optional. It's actually built into the rights. The second um, value that underpins CLD is about inclusion. And again, there's about four or five different articles from non-discrimination being right at the heart to refugee children, children with a disability, children with, from minority of indigenous groups. And it's so important that as community workers that we absolutely um, look towards including everybody as a society. Collaboration being another value, absolutely clear that we're working with young people to increase their own choices, that, that is a negotiated space and lifelong learning. And again, for me, out of the three articles, the goals of education, that absolutely allow young people to support their personality, their talents and their abilities to the full. That's where CLD comes in. Empowerment is the last but not least in terms of the different spaces where young people have actually learned to have their voices or they're encouraged to have their voices heard. Lastly, and as well, not lastly, the third question is it lastly, we're getting there clear. How can we help? I think it's about making rights real in terms of Avengers assembling, the unfearties making that um, visible, making children visible, making rights visible, and making CLD practice visible, finding that space for professional action, using the policy, the service delivery to find that space for delivery. It is about our monitoring and evaluation, and ultimately it's about Avengers telling our stories. So that's my five minute CLD children's right. Thank you for listening. Fantastic, Marion. Avengers Assemble seems like quite a good hashtag to be um, setting off with today as well, which is uh, pretty incredible. Thank you, Marion. A virtual round of applause from everyone um, who's watching today. That, that was fab. Well done. Um, and thank you for um, sticking to your time. That was very good. Next up is John. John, you've got the floor for five Hi. minutes. Follow yeah, that if you can, Avengers Assembly. Thanks to Marion for doing my talk for me. No, it's, like, um, it's just so lovely to follow Marion, actually, because she's touched on so many important things. And I think this idea that, that CLD is for all of us, that it's, it might be thought of sometimes as youth work, but it's actually much wider is what I want to pick up on. And it's for adults as well as young people. And it brings communities together in a way that other approaches uh, 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 don't do. And with my experience over the years, I've worked in all sorts of settings from early years right through to adult education with disabled young adults in, 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 uh, in sort of FE settings. And um, so I've seen it in all sorts of contexts. And I think never before have we needed CLD more, but at the same time, never have there been so many cuts in CLD. So we need to think of the politics of CLD and in terms of if the UNCRC and corporation means anything, then how are we going to support the communities to grow and to, um, and to move beyond well-being discourses to rights approaches for all ages of children and the people they are related to in their communities? Um, I think uh, people might not realize that CLD is as important in early years as anywhere else. 
Starting Strong was a huge EU research project and it shows that the, the most effective services for early years had, had a knowledge, had, had degree-led professionals leading them, but also with the knowledge of CLD. And that if you have a knowledge of community, you can build from the people in your areas to build really good early years services. And Bertram and Pascal's work really drew, uh, drew that out as well in the UK. Um, in terms of the UNCRC, the article around uh, 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 Article 23 and, and Articles 24 are really important. And, and in terms of disabled children, um, my own career is involved um, uh, supporting um, disabled children's voice and for them to be, their abilities, their, their ability to contribute to their own communities to be seen now in a league tables approach to schooling. Community education offers the spaces. And if we see a school as a community where, where disabled young people can succeed, and I know that personally, I was the young boy in a primary school who was in a special needs class and felt stigmatized. But the, 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 uh, the opportunities out with the rigid curriculum were what kind of saved me and a play through to um, uh, sports and becoming very successful at, at sport, becoming interested in mu music and creative activities that were uh, through youth, uh, youth work and engaging with youth workers. And at times I was close. I mean, one of the best youth workers I encountered worked in the police and probably saved me from another journey. So that is what the power of a community approach can do across the age groups. I think also we need to think about the COVID context that um, in places like Ireland, they, they actually have a year out in their, in their uh, schooling where young people can go and do community activities uh, between the exam levels. And maybe we had that opportunity and we've missed it with, with COVID. We could have rethought and actually thought about the central role of community approaches in, 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 in our schools and, and our ways of being. Um, I'd also like to say that I, I, I've learned, this was very nostalgic, I've learned lovely things over the years from so many community workers who, who have worked with that. I'd like to give a shout out to Ian Stewart and Mary Smith uh, in, 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 um, in Midlothian, who are probably the really formative, but other people like John Hogan in Liverpool and, and Mike Jones and other people, all of whom were influenced by the Murray House course in some way. These guys taught me the, the, the real importance. I, I think I saw myself a little bit as a knight in a shining armor who was going to go out there and solve everybody's problems. And, and actually they toned me down a bit. And you have to be very careful that you don't become the person who does things for people, but actually at the central, and to build on that, the, the, what Mary mentioned about Freire, the central idea is that once you've moved away, once you've supported, that the actual person has self-empowered. There's something left behind in the community that's bigger and better than what when you first went there. But it's not about your ego. It's not about my ego as a community worker. It's about what the community can do and about togetherness and about equality. And then about people actually feeling that they can take steps in their own lives to solve their own life's problems. I think that's what really I learned over the years in, in all these projects. One of my favorite projects was working with a group of young people in New Battle who we, we worked on photography with community-based workers who, who, who'd come from Strathclyde, who used to do a lot of work around photography, music and things like that. And uh, we had this lovely collage and it was for a training event with teachers and the young people were to come and they sort of bottled it on the morning and phoned me up and said, John, you can just present that stuff. We don't need to come. It's too dangerous for us to do this. There'll be consequences if we, we're seen as, as, as saying criticisms about adults. And I understood. So I went ahead and presented their thing. But what we did afterwards was sit, go back to them and say, how could we do this? And they, through working with them, we supported their confidence and we created a drama project where we brought in arts workers and eventually they presented what they had wanted to on stage as young actors. And that's what community education does. It supports people when they don't feel they can, they're supported, where they don't feel they have power, where they feel their voice is really risky. It supports them to then be the people on stage. Thanks. Thank you, John. That was incredible, really powerful um, 
statements in there as well. I look forward to picking those, some of those up in the, in the questions afterwards. Don't forget to be popping your questions in the Q&A um, section and Orla will be pulling those together. Um, okay, Margaret, I'm going to open the floor um, for you. Thrilled that you could be here and thank you so much. Thanks so much for coming. You've got the floor. You're on mute, Margaret. What? Is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. Right, okay. I have five minutes. Let me tell you a story. This is a story about speaking truth to power. In 2018, a visitor from America spent a fortnight travelling around UK communities, listening very carefully to the stories people told about their lives. He just happened to be not only a human rights lawyer, but the United Nations Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Philip Alston managed to penetrate the Brexit madness, naming and shaming UK poverty as a political choice. He accused the government of a complete disconnect, saying it's obvious to anyone who opens their eyes, queues for food banks, people sleeping rough, deep despair, loneliness, isolation. Austerity could easily have spared the poor if the political will had existed. But one actor only has stubbornly resisted seeing the situation for what it is, the UK government. For one in every two children to be poor in the fifth richest country is not only a disgrace, but a social calamity and an economic disaster. His words, not mine. In his report, Philip Alston accused the UK government of violating four human rights agreements related to women, children, disabled people and economic human rights. He said austerity has hit the poor, women, ethnic minorities, children, single parents, asylum seekers and people with disabilities disproportionately and Brexit will do the same. His report should be compulsory reading for everyone with a human rights agenda. Poverty is a violation of human rights simply because it's a political choice. It is not an economic necessity. And I see this as a betrayal of childhood. Austerity was imposed by the UK government at the very same time as tax breaks were given to the rich. And so the rich got richer at the same time as the poor got poorer. Child poverty isn't random. It follows those fault lines of structural oppression. So we can't tackle children's human rights separate from any other form of discrimination. And CLD is a player in the human rights agenda. So we urgently need a more complex understanding of power. It doesn't work along single issue lines like race or class or gender. It works as an interconnecting, intersecting whole. Intersectionality is the concept that captures the way that multiple discriminations are woven into an interlinking web of disadvantage. And so my challenge, it's absolutely impossible to tackle children's rights without tackling human rights as an interconnected whole. And my warning is CLD's always been targeted to serve the interests of power by easing the symptoms of oppression homelessness, food banks, unemployment, which is why we need an analysis of power that works for us. We need to be asking the right questions. But our political context poses a contradiction. Neoliberal political ideology elevates part profit over people and planet. There is no political will for a human rights agenda. And this is fundamentally a crisis of values. On one hand, neoliberal values of competition, individualism, profit, greed, privilege. And on the other hand, values of human rights, social justice, cooperation, empathy. But the exciting news for CLD, in my opinion, is that neuroscience has offered us new information on the human brain 
we have an empathy circuit. We are wired for compassion. We actually need to be kind and caring in order to be more fully human. And this is the basis for a revolution in human relationships. The challenge, I think, for CLD remains education for critical consciousness. I don't think CLD can meet its commitment to social justice without a unity of praxis, using theory and action and building theory from action, all founded on that really strong value base we have within a sharp critical analysis of power. I think addressing children's human rights involves changing the way we see the world from a love of power to the power of love, a love for all humanity. Thank you, Margaret. That was an incredibly powerful call to action for to the power of, of love. And that was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, our last speaker today then is uh, Cathy McCulloch who is the co-director of the Children's Parliament. Cathy, you and I have the floor. I don't know how you're going to follow those three incredible speakers, but I'm sure knowing you that you will. Over well, to you, Cathy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, never was the truism short straw so appropriate. But really, it's wonderful to, to see the threads across all the presentations. I graduated from Murray House in the Dark Ages um, when children were pretty invisible and children's human rights were nowhere to be seen um, <clears throat> and this year year of childhood children's parliament is celebrating 25 years and it's been a very long and difficult journey we began in 1992 because children told us that they wanted a place where adults would take them seriously not just things that adults felt were important but things that children felt were important too and they wanted us to use the word parliament because they felt that if it didn't have the word parliament it might not be taken seriously and they felt that parliament was a proper important grown-up thing so we stayed true to that despite many attempts for for us to change it um and and Colin Morrison, my co-director, co-founder, and I decided that we would try and make this happen. And so we, we set up Children's Parliament and we framed it and rooted it in children's human rights in the UNCRC, which had been ratified by the UK government a year before in 1991. We took the UNCRC and we reckoned it needed to be made a bit more child friendly. And so we, we broke it down into six themes. Who we are, where we live, health and happiness, freedom, feeling safe and being cared for and having our say. Most people think having our say is the UNCRC, but of course that's one important part of it, but it is just one part of it. And we thought the best way to make progress on this would be to, to run demonstration projects, which we did from the Western Isles down to the borders and everywhere in between. And we thought once people see the transformative effect of a children's rights approach, they'll want to do it themselves. They'll want to, to have these transformative uh, impacts in their own areas. But what, what happened, honestly, what happened was that we left a series of, of good practice vacuums across Scotland, because what we were relying on were individuals getting it, and then those individuals being able to influence the systems, huge, unwieldy systems, as Margaret, around power and control that um, no single individual or a small group of people can change. Um, we can come back to um, other uh, anthropologists who have a different view about that. So we um, we understood that if we're going to, to change the systems, we have to change the culture. And our culture at the moment is predicated on reward and punishment. And that's where power and authority and control sits. So if we're going to shift that reward and punishment, we need to work collectively and we need to put human rights values of trust kindness, empathy, and respect for human dignity at the heart of everything that we do. Culture change, however, needs to involve the whole of community, the whole community. Everybody needs to feel touched, engaged, inspired, have their awareness raised about what it is we're talking about. And that's why CLD has such an important role, I think. And I'll just, I just have one example, and it involves Claire, Claire McGilvery here. We had um, most of the children who are referred to children's parliament programmes are referred because they face challenges in their lives through their families or through their engagement with school, friendships, confidence, chaotic family backgrounds and so forth. And two girls were, were referred to our programme um, way back in 2017, Faith and Megan, and they got involved in a, a community planning programme with us called Streets Ahead Trinent. 
and we um, involved the children. It was about children having their say about where they lived, what worked and what didn't work. And we involved the community. They shared their ideas. The children did local and national presentations. They created this massive mural based on the ideas of 250 children across the community. Um, we could see them growing in confidence. We could see their abilities, their, their skill set increase. They came, it took a bit of encouragement, but they came to the UN in Geneva, they presented on the world stage, they had, they did presentations, they had individual conversations. It was just amazing to watch them thrive and flourish. And Claire, who had supported the group um, in Trinent and in their journey to the UN, recognised the potential and offered Megan and Faith an opportunity to come and get involved in what was the Fosside Women's Group. And as Claire said, until Megan and Faith rocked up and shook, shook us up, at which time it became women, a Fosside Women and Girls Group. So to what, what happened there was Claire recognised something and, the, and Faith and Megan have gone on to, to plan and to host International Women's Day events. And the pride of their mum, they've dragged their mums along who'd never been in any kind of event like that in the community before, to see the pride of their mums watching their girls comfortably, confidently hosting something in their local community for 100 women was just extraordinary, as was seeing the local women recognise the role they were playing in helping these children thrive and flourish. It was just amazing to watch it. But of course, the kids didn't just rock up, as Claire said, they were nurtured, they were given a, a safe passage. What Claire had done was recognise the value of children in her community. She had high expectations of them. I think often children surpass any, our expectations of kids are often so low um, that we don't often give them opportunities to thrive and flourish and show what they really can do. And what it do, and she, we also are committed to involving families in the wider community so that they get a sense of the children's journeys and can see children in a new light. And I just at this point want to flag up that we use the term, I use the term children at Children's Parliament, we do deliberately. Young people are marginalised, children are marginalised. I would argue that children are even more marginalised than young people. And so if we're talking about children, I think it's important to say children and to use that word. So in this year of childhood, I would what can we do together? Well, first thing I would do is to encourage you, if you're not already, to become an unfairty. Claire's shown off with her massive unfairty badge today. Um, and encourage others to join the network. You know, come on board, help us to build the network, share excitements, challenges, opportunities, help us to make it a network network that works for you to help you on this children's rights journey um, and make a commitment, make your commitment known in order that all of our children can be active, empowered, engaged and equal members of our communities. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, Cathy. I hope you're all whooping and cheering behind the scenes there um, about uh, Cathy's presentation. And also, you know, John and Margaret and Marion as well. What strikes me is that is the power of um, using human rights as an approach to actually support children in becoming the fullest potential that they can be in their lives. And as adults, we've got a responsibility to do that in every way that we can. And as um, uh, CLD practitioners, if you are a CLD practitioner, it's our responsibility to be supporting children and creating an environment within our communities that we work and live to be able to enable that empowerment uh, of children to, to happen. If Faith and Megan were all here, they'd be giving me pelters about the tunes that were on at the beginning as well. Mm -hmm. Um, that's an invite for you all to come International Women's Day next year, where no doubt we'll be um, causing havoc uh, as usual. So we're now going to pop over into questions and Orla has been working furiously behind the scenes to um, give us some of the questions, that, the themes that are coming out of the dialogue. So the first question is, how do we ensure information about the UNCRC and Corporation Bill is shared with schools? Um, my experience is that UNCRC being passed in Parliament is not on the school's agenda or the radar, but it's so important. Um, who would like to take that one first? Marianne, fade away. I think that's going to be about partnership work, Claire. And I think that's absolutely about, um, <clears throat> A, about community workers working with schools and working with parents and using the whole family learning model working with children and young people. Um, but I think there's also a responsibility on schools and the general formal education system to kind of 
do you know, their awareness of it and understanding of it and, and where are they building the human rights and the, the various articles into their A, learning and teaching programmes, but then also their service provision, that wraparound that's happening, do you know, and some of the work that I think that both John and Cathy described quite eloquently, do you know, um, there is that possibility, but for me, it's about partnership work, do you know, and responsibility for your own sector role in that. Thanks, Mary. And John, do you want to come in about that? Yeah, I mean, we've worked quite hard to get CLD into all the professions who work with children. And it's in the key um, uh, learning, professional uh, learning outcomes. Um, but uh, I mean, there is sometimes resistance. But uh, so when I went to Murray House we, and set up the degree for early years professionals, uh, we went to John Bamber, who would develop the workplace learning courses there. And, and we incorporated those courses into into the degree, but I think it's really important to think of CLD as not a project, but actually as I, I love the way it was set up by Marion Area about values and, and, and about being a verb and a doing, because it's, it's more than just that moment or the, some of the projects I was discussing there. It's actually at the core, can be at the core of our profession. And the, I think the best of school teachers actually are aware of that. They really under, understand and build, build relationships. So I don't want to put down, I think there's some great work going on and particularly Mary Smith and uh, Christine Mackay actually was uh, Mary Smith's, uh, first introduced Mary Smith to me in Midlothian. The work they did there was incredible, but Mary Smith retired from being the head of children's services there. The culture and the values may be changing and becoming more um, league table focused. So then some of those posts that were in schools, family support worker roles, which were community workers, as well, and, and youth workers who were doing this, the things around the school to, to create that cool school community. Some of the funding cuts are starting to hit on those professionals. So that idea that is core to the school is starting to be backed off. Um, Cathy, do you want to come in on that? Because um, it kind of follows on a bit of, of your critique about um, how do we actually invest in that whole culture change, that transformative culture change for children, rather than just relying on an individual leader to be able to make um, change happen. Yeah, well, obviously, incorporation gives us an amazing opportunity because now it's not optional. Uh, people have to adhere to the UNCRC. So we're seeing a huge increase in requests for support, for training, um, which we're not able to respond to just now. Hopefully we will be in a few months' time, but there's clearly an appetite for it now that there wasn't before. So I'm hoping that people can use this as not just a, a legal imperative, but a moral imperative to be doing better and to be doing the right things and putting the right values at the heart. So at the moment, I suppose... For me, the biggest opportunity, the most, the thing I'm most excited about is that the UNCRC gives us a framework that we all are now signed up to, whether we like it or not. So no longer is it up to our children dependent on individuals deciding that they're going to be kind, show trust, have empathy, respect their human dignity. They're required to by law. So the, the, in terms of creating a movement and creating progress, I think the Unfairty movement is actually a really good opportunity because it's the only place I can that I know of where people who are interested in this work can come together and join a network of people who don't are not all experts. You know, we're not all experts. We don't all have vast amounts of experience or qualifications in this, but we all have a passion for doing things better, and we understand that there's that the UNCRC embedding and realising children's rights actually gives us the best way to do that. So I think we need to self-identify to each other and form a network so we can support one another to make progress together. It's too it's like hard this, to do on your own. It's that Avengers <laughs> Assemble again. Like I can't wait yeah. to get a badge that does that as well. Um, <laughs> Margaret, have you got any thoughts around that? Oh, I've got lots of thoughts around it, really. But I'm um, trying to think of how I can put that very simply. Um, I think that kindness on its own is not transformative. I think that we have to have radical kindness. And I can't quite see how that fits into an education system that's founded on competition. That was one thought, because competition isn't kind and poverty is cruel. So if we know that poverty destroys poor children's cognitive ability before they even set foot into a school, how do we work with kindness there? And they, I know these are big questions, but they're questions that we must keep 
at the forefront of our minds while we're doing that groundwork at the same time. And I say to my young, he's over my shoulder somewhere, my beautiful, kind, caring grandson, who's got the biggest, kindest heart in the world, when he gets bullied by children who are taught, I'm better than you, I'm, you know, you're this, you're that, and he comes home crying, and I say, but kindness is your superpower, and how can I keep telling him that, unless it works as a superpower? <laughs> Um, these are the sort of things going through my mind. They're big questions for all of us, I know. But I, what I'm trying to get at is, um, don't let's kid ourselves, you know. What we're doing is fantastic because we're living with the values that we need to be fully human and we need to be um, expansive and fully engaged and connected with each other. But we're living in a world of disconnection that puts a price on every single thing in the world, from a child to an elephant to everything. And if you haven't got a price on you, you don't matter. So some lives don't matter. And poor lives are treated like human detritus. And that's, you know, what, I, what I'm saying, let's not ever forget that. And I guess, no, I think that's a really important point because those structural inequalities are compounded um, and felt more strongly, particularly for most marginalised communities during COVID. And I think um, we were in a session yesterday, Marion, with CLD workers who are saying that actually, how do we protect our services and our support when CLD is being cut? Um, and how do we then support children and their families where there are services that are being cut? So we're fighting for our own lives almost um, with CLD being uh, almost the poor neighbour in the education um, sector. So one of the questions that's come in is how do we as the CLD sector support families and communities um, so that children have agency to make decisions about their own lives and to be able to um, hold power to account um, in the way that um, we would hope that the UNCRC gives us those tools to do. Anyone want to come in about that? Kathy? Yeah, I just, um, just, I think for me, it's about partnerships. It's been mentioned before. It's about working collaborati collaboratively and it's wor working across the professions. So if you have, John mentioned teachers, we work with fantastic police officers, social workers, teachers, CLD workers, librarians, when you have an opportunity to work across sectors, it starts to open people's eyes to the possibilities that they didn't think were, were there before. And it also offers support and resources to people so that they don't, they feel less isolated. So in Trinent, for example, we had a whole range of people from the community involved, which has led to the children, you know, some of the children coming along after a couple of years to an event to celebrate the UNCRC without us actually having worked with them directly for a couple of years and that for me demonstrates that they felt engaged they felt respected they felt valued and they felt part of a community so I think cross-sectoral intersectionality cross-sectoral working to to um, encourage support and to be able to share challenges and opportunities is really important Marion or Joan I think Marian. Um, for me clearly it is 100% about relationships you know because that's a, a big question you asked and for me, the power of a really good um, CLD practitioner is their ability to um, build relationships. Do you know, I was speaking to a, a director of education last week who was saying to me, I actually need more community workers. I don't know if I need more teachers, but I need more community workers. I need people, you know, who have got your skills and abilities that don't have that um scary bit about being a teacher but that you're all very kind and that you know when to level with people you say hello you look people in the whites of the eye you have a cup of tea it's that welcoming space that can allow these relationships and that's not just about working with children and young people and families that's about working across professions because I think a um, hundred percent what Cathy said anytime in my practice where magic really happened where the magic really truly empowered communities was where there was a meeting of minds and sharing of practice and challenge in between different professionals because we all can be in we can all be guilty of being in an echo chamber and I don't think that's helpful for the children and the young people that we serve you know so I think there's something about the relationships 
really good CLD practice um, and actually being a bit more outward looking, you know, having your own space, but look out, look out. That would be my suggestions. Thanks, Marian. I, th I think to link to Marion there and, and, uh, and also connect to Margaret as well, the... Um, I've been doing a bit of work with a community worker who trained in Dundee uh, called Christina Malerva Quarrel, who is a great friend of mine who, wor who works in Glasgow and, uh, and is a poet and a community artist. And we've been talking about cultures of shame and values around shame. And I think that this, the, the, the idea that um, in our school system that we create these kind of league tables, we create, there's a whole culture of shame going on that's not being addressed. And that links to the point of bullying and kindness made earlier by Mar Margaret. But the flip side of that is actually to support people to, to see their abilities, to see that wh wherever they live and whoever they are, where, where I jock Tamsin's bairns, and, and to support people's abilities as equals is the flip side of that that CLD brings to it and to get away from cultures of shame. And I thought, what was brilliant, whatever your political perspective, what was brilliant about the referendum for independence was actually how the two set sides mobilized and used basic community education kind of ideas to mobilize uh, groups of people into campaigning. And my own experience in, on the side, I, I was on the side of the butterfly revolution. So uh, all these people that came together pro-independence, I don't, I don't want to offend anybody with my, with my position, but I was on a stall and I didn't, I knew the names of my immediate people, but we would run out of leaflets and they would appear. And there was like a whole system behind of people mobilizing and having this sense of togetherness to get something to done. Now, COVID comes along. And Pat Dolan tells us this story and, and, and he's very strong in community work in Ireland, in NUI Galway, the university there, and he's working with groups of young people. They had floods in the west of Ireland. They've had them for over se several years. Young people turned up to the floods in Ireland and said, how could we help? Because they'd been so mobilized by community work in their area. They saw it as their role to be leaders. And the, the services were saying, get away, you wee kids, what are you going to do? But actually, eventually, they engaged and they worked along with the police and the fire services to put the, the, the barriers up to the floods. This is our moment like that. COVID's our moment like that. But we've actually got the kids in doing exams or trying to, and they cancelled the exams, but at one point they were going to do them. We've got them in classrooms doing a rigid learning when they could have been the greatest resource we had at our hands to support the feeding of, the, of people who don't have access to food at the moment. Yeah, we could have mobilised in a way that is radical that Margaret said. But unfortunately, our political parties at six weeks to an election in Scotland, our political parties all sign up to the same economic model. They just did it in the budget. There's a hardly a difference. Take out the Tories who are on shame, their shame discourses and the way they have treated women. And I won't go into all the clauses, but uh, and, and you get a peerage for that now, the way you've treated women. But let's leave that. Take the Tories out. The rest of the parties, they're all the same on economics. So we have a problem that the system isn't radical and it doesn't shift quickly and it doesn't see young people as a resource in the way that they could have been. So I think we have to think, as Scotland goes forward, as the UK goes forward, and Margaret's I call to radicalism is, is not a call about some kind of right or left wing politics. It's about a call to the abilities that are enshrined in the UNCR, the fullest abilities and capable, capabilities of the children and young people and their communities mm -hmm. to lead for us. So there's some there if we can hang on to something there and actually chart out a vision for you know we get to a really good place um john i think that um is an incredible place for us to stop because i'm conscious of time we've got about um seven minutes left and a few thanks and things to do but um enormous thanks to the panel we'll do the proper thanks in a minute but I just want to introduce um, behind the scenes Catherine and Mao who are our incredible students um, who are at Murray House at the moment and have come up with the idea of hosting this session because they felt that there were some gaps in their learning around how they could use the UNCRC in their practice. So I'm just going to quickly introduce Mao and Catherine and give us a little bit of 
um, an insight into your thought process to bring UNCRC and CLD to the world and to get everyone excited about it. Um, hi, yeah, thank you, Claire. And I just want, uh, so I'm Mao and uh, I'm a fourth year community education student at Maury House. And um, Catherine, do you just wanna go ahead and present yourself as well? Hi there, I'm Catherine, doing the same course as mine as well. Um, and I think one of the major things that came out uh, during our uh, placement at the Children's Parliament was the gap in between um, children's children and children's rights and the community education practice, uh, the community education course, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to thank all of the speakers for coming and all the participants for coming. Thank you so much. Um, it's like amazing to see how far we've come since 1992, as Kathy was talking about. Um, and it's also incredible to see how many people are interested um, in making children's rights a part of community learning and development. Um, and I hope that this paves the way for children's rights and children to be taken much more seriously than they are. Hi, from my personal experience, I believe this is important because my views were not that it is a child. Not all children have an adult who listen to them. The need for children's rights embedded in community learning development personally, I believe, could change a child's life. All children deserve this. From my academic studies, this is important because I see links between experiences, yet academically it's not always been encouraged. I understand the thoughts, feelings, fears and beauty children hold cannot always be seen. It's our job as CLD practitioners to remember and acknowledge children have a voice and children have rights. Really excited we've had this conversation today because CLD can embrace the UNCRC incorporation within policy and practice just like we do child protection, and hopefully continue this dialogue where children's rights and CLD are combined, where practitioners speak of love and hope in their work, remembering how it is to be a child in a crazy beautiful world. Thank you everyone. We would now like to hand back over to Claire now. Um, massive round of applause to both of you for taking the gauntlet back to the CLD teachers um, and back to Marion as well at the Standards Council to think about, OK, how do we actually embed this learning and teaching around the UNCRC and around human rights and a rights-based approach into the practice of the workforce of CLD um, practitioners? So I look forward to the continued dialogue and thanks for being so brave and bold to bring forward your ideas um, to fruition. If you don't pass your placement because of this, like there'll have to be words said behind the scenes because you've been incredible at planning. So well done. Um, and I'm sure you'll not have any bother getting a job in the future as CLD practitioners if you're going to be this bold and brave. Um, thank you so much. It's left to me then with a couple of minutes left to thank our incredible speakers today. Thanks to Marion Allison for that call to action of Avengers Assemble um, for us as CLD workers, for us as um, children's rights practitioners to, to be behind that vanguard of, um, of rights and practice that underpin our, our values for um, community development. Thanks to John for telling us um, his stories about the UNCRC um, meaning so much in terms of practice and community work and about not being too dangerous in terms of our approach to supporting um, young people and children and, and their ability to dream, to dream big and to, to transform their experiences, particularly um, with children with disabilities and using the power of the creative in their, in their worlds. Thanks to Margaret for, for that call to action, for that radical power of love in the work that we do. I think that's an incredible um, call to action to transform the neoliberal um, escapism that our powerful econo economies um, seem to um, espouse at the moment. And what can we do um, as practitioners to actually support children and young people to change that along with their communities. I think it's a powerful call to action and, and we definitely need a revolution in critiquing that power basis that um, 
surrounds our society. And thanks to Cathy for her incredible 25 year journey in pushing for the UNCRC um, and in pushing for children's rights to be made real in practice and for the work that the Children's Parliament does. Um, thank you um, for all of that. Um, thanks to the people who have put in questions. And I know that it's been a little bit frustrating for you if you put in questions. We only got to a couple of them, but they'll form the future of, of the dialogue as we move forward with, with these dialogues and, um, and other events. I want to thank the, the team behind the scenes at the Children's Parliament who've made this happen, to Catherine and Mao. Uh, our amazing students, to Orla, Rona, Ross and Jess who have been behind the scenes and to you I want to, to really thank the people who have come along and showed their support today. You're all on fearties just by being here. You're the people who are courageous, um, unafraid to talk about children's rights and children's issues um, and you're making a difference in children's rights and you're willing to stand up alongside children in Scotland. So following today's events, um, we'll send all of you on Fairties um, an email with a link to the web page um, so that you can join up. You'll have to make your own one if you want a big one. You get a wee badge like that, but if you want your own one, you'll have to get the, the glue sticks out um, so that you can sign up to join the movement. And we'll send a link to the web page with further information and resources on children's human rights and CLD um, and a link for our evaluation. We'd really appreciate if you could take a few minutes to complete this because this is the first um, webinar session that we've been hosted. So thank you so much. I'm hoping this will be the first of many conversations and actions to make connections between children's rights and CLD um, real. Um, go and have the rest of the day and be an amazing. Thank you so much. And well done to everyone who's been here. Bye.